Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new video. Tonight we have three more incredibly unsettling and unsolved mysteries. Let's dive right in. We begin with the mystery of the crew of the L8. It was August 16th, 1942. We were in the final stretch of the Second World War. Lieutenant Ernest Cody and Ensign Charles Adams boarded the L-8 airship, a large blimp that once held branding for Goodyear, but was now essential in taking supplies to the Navy. That was the plan, anyway. Ernest and Charles set off from their position in Treasure Island, California, looking for any sign of enemy submarines. Only an hour into their patrol, they noticed something below. It was described as an oil slick, and the two men radioed to say that they were going to investigate. The crew of the L-8s was never heard from again. Tensions were high, as the last transition that was heard had come three hours before the blimp was seen or heard from again. It was around 10 or 11 a.m. when San Francisco Shore Patrol reported the blimp. It was seen crashing near a golf course, eight miles off course. An article published a day after the crash described the event, saying, The blimp, with its bag partially buckled and sagging in midair, floated slowly over the housetops and treetops to a crash landing on Bellevue Street in Daly City, five miles south of San Francisco. Further down, the mystery begins to unfold. The crew's parachutes were racked neatly in the blimp's gondola. The life raft was still attached. Some houses were near the collision site with one woman's house being grazed, but no one was hurt and no serious damage came from the crash. The men who were aboard the blimp? Well, they weren't aboard. Police and rescue were on the scene in an instant, but their search only led to more questions. First, of course, where was the crew? According to the article we spoke of a few moments ago, we see that there were reports of two men being seen parachuting from the blimp, but these were never confirmed. Many assumed the two men, in the event of a crash, would have radioed in, saying that there were difficulties with the flight, but this didn't happen. Another strange bit of info is the eyewitness account from a woman named Ida Ruby. She was riding horseback when she said the blimp first came into view. Using binoculars to get a better look, she stated that she was, quote, quite sure she saw three men on board. Later, she said, quote, I noticed the blimp out and over the water. It was very low, and I could plainly see the letters spelling out Navy. Then I noticed the N and A had disappeared, and that the entire blimp had been folding into a rough V-shape. This claim of three men being present is incredibly strange, seeing as only two men were confirmed to be aboard when the blimp departed. With that said, three parachutes were on the blimp, but this could have just been a precautionary measure. Officially, the men were labeled as missing and lost at sea after a two-day search, but that's just the beginning. There are many other theories that have surfaced over the years. Many theories have come simply because of the condition the blimp crashed in. An article three days following the crash said, Valved had been opened to dump the fuel. The motors were still. The door to the cabin was open. A bit further down, the article states, The alternative conjecture then was that Cody and Adams leaped into the sea or that they fell in. Presumably, each wore a life belt as two were missing from the cabin. According to some sources, the Navy concluded the men left the blimp involuntarily, meaning they were forced from the craft. This makes some sense, however, there are things that don't line up. The radio was still in full working order, so if the men were going down or forced off, why wouldn't they radio to inform the Navy? Furthermore, no emergency protocol was taken. Lastly, if the two men did abandon the craft, assuming they took their life jackets with them, why haven't their bodies been located? Other theories included an attack from the Japanese, but it was later confirmed that there was no evidence of this. What about the mysterious third man who was supposedly aboard? 
If another man had made it into the blimp, how? And why wouldn't the men have defended themselves? And again, where's that third man? If he left the blimp with them, he would have been found as well. With the logical conclusions not answering any questions, some have turned to paranormal explanations. Talk of a UFO abduction, the men slipping into another dimension, and even them finding California's version of the Bermuda Triangle, but I want to stay more grounded in reality. This is where the idea that this was an experiment done by the military comes into play. A few years before this took place, in October of 1939, a military cargo plane departed from San Diego with what has been described as mystery cargo. A few hours following its departure, the control tower received numerous distress calls from the plane. Not long after, the plane was approaching the runway, returning to its takeoff location. There had been no more communication at this point for some time. When officials made their way onto the plane, they found the entire crew deceased with what was described as a gaping hole in their chests. Even the pilot and co-pilot were deceased. The co-pilot was in the pilot's seat and their guns had been drawn and empty casings littered the floor. This case, just like the one we talked about in the beginning, hasn't been solved. Some believe, though, that these two cases are connected. Could it have been some strange experiment gone haywire? Our military is known to deal with some incredibly strange things. Take Project MK Ultra as an example. What do you make of this whole story? Do you think the men jumped from the craft themselves, or were they forced off by Japanese soldiers? Was there actually someone else aboard the blimp? Let me know in the comments below. Next up is the strange case of Robert Davidson. June 30th, 1987 was the night Robert Davidson's life would change. It was that night, around 5 p.m., he and his wife were driving through Lexington, Ohio, when a storm began rolling in. Not wanting to get soaked, the two pulled over and pulled on rain jackets. In the process, however, Robert was struck by lightning. An article published the day of the incident said Davidson, quote, was treated at the scene by passing motorist and rushed via lifeline helicopter to the hospital, where he remains in the intensive care unit. Robert went on to make a miraculous recovery and lived to tell his tale. This story, however, wasn't what anyone was expecting. Robert went on to claim that he was visited by an unknown woman wearing a long, black dress seemingly from the 1800s. She also held a Bible to her chest. That is only the beginning, however. Richard Nybert, a firefighter on the scene, stated that the ambulance lost power, rendering it useless and saving Robert's life. Seeing as how it had backup batteries, this should have been an impossible event. It was following this that the woman in black made her appearance. According to numerous eyewitnesses, the woman stated that she needed to touch Robert, so they allowed it. The woman made her way to Robert and, according to reports, began chanting in a different language, described as speaking in tongues, recited the 23rd Palm, and slammed her Bible into the ground numerous times. Minutes passed until finally... She vanished. Seconds later, the power came back on in the ambulance, and Robert, who had been on the brink of losing his life, was showing much improvement. So, who was this woman in black that seemed to be from the 1800s? Well, first, it's noteworthy that not everyone there claimed to have seen the woman. A few paramedics and the firefighter we mentioned before were the only ones I've found that have mention of it. Others make no mention or simply say she wasn't there. One paramedic, Mary Lou Schaefer, said, There is no doubt in my mind. She was there. As the debate continued as to whether or not she was there, others began speculating who she was. 
It was eventually decided that she had been a minister or a teacher at the Acton campground centuries ago. Could the woman in black come from her grave just to save Robert's life? I'm not totally sure. I have little belief in the paranormal to that extent, but other theories just don't seem to make sense. Consider a shared hallucination. What are the chances? Furthermore, without getting too far into something I know nothing about, that being mental health, it seems that idea is more of a mental disorder rather than something that just takes place. What do you make of Robert's story? Do you believe a woman from the 1800s came back just to save his life, or was it simply a coincidence that the ambulance lost power? How would you explain away the paramedics and the firefighters who claim to have seen the woman in black? Let me know in the comments section below. Finally, we have something straight out of classic folklore, the Champlain Monster. Champ has become known as America's Loch Ness Monster. The story begins much farther back than some would expect. Samuel de Champlain, the man who founded Quebec and who the lake was named after, is regarded as having the first sighting, all the way back in 1609. To be fair though, this claim is debated amongst many. If he wasn't the first, then a report from 1819 in the Plattsburgh Republican would be. Someone only referred to as Captain Crumb reported seeing something that was around 187 feet long and only 200 yards from his position. While this is the oldest recorded sighting, it wouldn't be until the late 1800s that interest in the idea of a lake monster really came into play. In 1883, another man, Sheriff Nathan H. Muni, claimed to have seen a large creature from where he was standing on shore. According to the report, the creature was close enough for him to make out round white spots inside of its mouth, and he believed it to be 25 to 30 feet tall. P.T. Barnum, a politician and showman, kept the idea of Champ alive, when in 1873 and 1887, he offered rewards for anyone who could provide irrefutable proof of the monster in the lake. Of course, no one ever has, or maybe they have. Over the years, numerous reports have come forward claiming to have captured Champ. Some of the most notable reports are Sandra Mancy's photograph and the video taken by Dick Affelter and his stepson, Pete Baudet. First, let's look at Sandra's photo. According to her account, she traveled out to Lake Champlain while vacationing in the area. While she and her family were relaxing on the shore, this popped up out of the lake. Of course, if you go in with the mindset of it being Champ, you're going to see Champ. But many speculate not the authenticity of the photo, but rather what's in it. Many say this photo of Champ is nothing more than a log or a tree branch that is floating and bobbing in the water. This artist's rendition shows what Sandra could have actually been seeing. As I said, if you're expecting to see Champ, you'll see Champ. And Sandra not only grew up in the area, but said on Unsolved Mysteries that her grandfather often teased her about Champ being in the water. This would be, despite her saying that she didn't believe, a reason to make an assumption of something before looking at a more plausible solution. Next is the video that was taken by Dick and his stepson. Here you can see something similar to what was in the photo by Sandra, only here the figure seems to bob up and down out of the water. In some instances you can see what looks to be an extremely large body poking up out of the water for a second or so. I've tried to stabilize the footage so it's easier to make out. Finally, there are the reported sounds of Champ that were recorded in 2003 by the Fauna Communications Research Institute. The sounds are said to be similar to that of a beluga whale or dolphin, though they do not live in Lake Champlain. As a matter of fact, Lake Champlain is believed to only be about 14 feet deep, meaning 
There is no way something of this size could survive out there. Some say Champ is a prehistoric dinosaur, or something similar to an alligator or crocodile, possibly a species that we haven't discovered yet. Others believe strongly that it is a creature all of its own. What do you make of this whole story? Thank you all so much for taking some time out of your night or your day or your afternoon to sit down and watch this video or listen to it over on Anchor. I hope wherever you listened or watched, you enjoyed. I want to take a quick second to thank my $10 patrons and three of my most recent channel members. Everyone you see on screen right now is supporting the channel monthly to get videos early, some behind the scenes things, script access early, lots of really, really cool perks. So go down below and check out the Patreon page if you want to hear more about that. As for everyone else, I appreciate you all the same. I hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, stay safe out there.